wonderful introductions. And I welcome to the Rockton uh, Technology Conference. And this is a FinTech part. And today, uh, we will focus on Rockton payment companies, especially Rockton Pay applications. Before starting the presentation, I will touch upon a few things uh, about the Rockton and Rock Japanese uh, payment uh, industries. As you may know, Japanese cashless ratio around 20% at uh, 2017, and the government has planned to increase more than double or uh, 2025 because they want to increase the improvement of productivity by using cashless promotion. And a cashless is essential for the inbound demand. And as we calculated, the government is budgeting over 400 billion GPY for cashless promotions from last month to next June. They will use this budget for terminal implementation fee, you know, two, thirds of, two thirds of terminal implementation fee and one third of transaction fee. And an entire point reward. And this is from internal survey of JCB. Over 80% of shoppers think Cashless payment is more convenient than cash payment. And also, over 80% of accountant of shop. Especially convenience store, 83% of accountants say that they prefer cashless payment. And this is Rocked as fintech services, especially in a payment related product, because we have uh, securities and insurance, also crypto. But we have this kind of payment related product mobile payment, and e money, credit card, point card, and bank functions. Today, we will focus on mobile payment, and we call Rocked and Pay. What is Rocked and Pay? It's easy ID, it's a Rockton's ID uh, is using uh, for payment. Uh, we call it Rockton Pay. And a feature of Rockton Pay applications, we have three features right now. And a payment, and a remittance, and a point reward. You can use our value, Rockton Cash, Rock the Eddy, it was credit card and a super point through these applications. And we are expanding Rocked in Pay Network. It's touch point. And you can use Rock the Super Point and Credit Card in this touch point. We actually uh, we have three million touch point in Japan. And today's speaker, first speaker is mobile application engine Adi. He will touch upon about subs integrations. And second present is uh, Joseph. We focus on our platform product. Okay, I want to invite Adi for the stage. Good afternoon. Thank you, Shiona san uh, So, I'm Adi. Uh, here's a brief slide about me. I'm a senior IOS developer at Rakuten Payment. And I've just been with Rakuten Payment for three years now. I know it's not a lot of time, but in the world of payments, it's more like a decade. I like iOS and also secretly like Android. So, let's get into the contents. So, this is the three major topics we'll be focusing on. Uh, it's going to be integrations, application, and protocol layer. So uh, the way I would describe this is like, think of it as a tree, okay? And integrations being like the roots of the tree, 
you know, uh, who sustained the life, who provided water and food. So in this case, our integrations are the other services and the technologies that we use to drive payments. Then, of course, we have the protocol layer. This makes up the trunk of our tree, which funnels, you know, nutrition and resources and uh, to the leaves and all the energy back to the roots. So that forms our protocol layer, which in our case acts as the interface to payment terminals and uh, other technologies and even third-party apps and SDKs. And finally, we have the application, which uh, continuing with our metaphor is the sweet fruits of our tree. It is the only thing that the end users see, but as you can see, there's a lot behind the application. So let's dive into integrations. Okay, first up, one of our major features is the ability to earn points, okay? So you might have seen this screen. So there's a nice little thank you, but what's more importantly is that you get points awarded with each of your purchase. Our users love to earn these points and you know, it makes every purchase a little bit more uh, friendly. And of course, we also have the history screen where we show the points and, you know, I just enjoy to check again and again how many points that I've earned. Next up, we have our integrations with Rakuten Cash and Rakuten Point SDK. So the first screen here shows you an example of sending someone the money. You know, back in the day after maybe uh, Nomika the previous night, you have to settle your uh, whatever accounts with cash or bank transfer or something. But now you can just uh, transfer money to everyone. And another interesting feature about this is that you can generate a URL and then just share this URL via any SNS platform with your friend. And uh, interesting use case of that is like, if you have a group of friends, you can just generate a URL with like say 100 yen and you can post it on the group. And the first person to click that link gets money. That's a little game we play in the developer team. Next up, uh, how do you get this cash that you send to your other users? So you can charge your account with that cash. You can use either credit card or a bank to charge this cash, a Rakuten credit card or Rakuten bank. And finally, we have the point SDK. So points are now first class citizens. Uh, before they used to be in a menu somewhere, but now we uh, it gets its own tab. So it's easier for users to just, you know, kind of earn points. Okay, next up, uh, we have our merchant application. So uh, we also have a merchant application which allows the merchants to process payments. You know, when you go to pay at a merchant, the merchant is probably using this app to generate a payment and allow you to pay for it. Uh, we support uh, like tablets and phones because you know several merchants like to have huge tablets which is more convenient for them. We have like a huge variety of payments so not just QR but we also support like quick pay, EDI, ID and all the other services. Uh, these are our POS devices or terminals. So the first one that you can see that it looks like a hockey puck is uh, the e-money payment. So you can just tap your contactless card, whether it be Eddie or Suica or ID, and your payment is done. The second one is uh, for credit card. It supports IC chip and magnetic strip. And the third one is like uh, best of both worlds, as it supports e-money as well as uh, a credit card. Okay, next up, we made a new friend this year. Uh, they're called AUKDDI. So this was actually a much bigger partnership that also involved logistics and communication. But focusing on the payment side, uh, uh, AU Pay can now pay at all Rakuten uh, merchants, uh, like anyone with a QR code. So if you have a Rakuten Pay app, you can just scan this QR and pay as you're familiar with. But also, if you have AU Pay app and you don't have Rakuten Pay at that time, then you can just scan the same QR and make a payment. And of course, our merchant app also allows uh, AU Pay users in. Uh, I would recommend to use Rakuten Pay because how else would you earn the points? Yeah, so this is a real world example of how you would use AU Pay at a merchant. Okay, now uh, that's it for integration. So let's delve into the application. 
So this year uh, we brainstormed and we came up with a whole new architecture to make our app more extendable and kind of scalable because we have been adding so many new features all the time that we want to come up with something that is more easier to expand. Uh, internally we were calling this project Tetris because you know it's kind of like putting the pieces together and making the app work. So let's see what it is about. So why do we choose this architecture? Mainly because of these five goals. So because now as our teams have been grown, we have to focus on being able to distribute and, and, uh, and develop independently. We also have code reusability where we were finding that a lot of our developers were, you know, rewriting codes that they didn't need to write and, you know, writing the same thing over and over again. Then we also uh, improve uh, and touch upon program readability and quality. And we also encapsulate uh, this thing and it also makes it easier to test. So let's see how we make all this happen. Okay, so this is uh, the app structure on a very high level. So as you can see, all these components were previously inside the app here, but now we have kind of bring them all out of the app during development. Of course, when we distribute, we package it all together into one app. So as you can see, the app is simply now uh, has a coordinator and resources. Uh, we'll get into coordinator later. Resources for now are just simple images or assets like uh, the app icon or the launch screen, which is the first screen you see when you launch the app. This forms the SDK layer, which is kind of like our all the internal tools and uh, pieces of code that you need to make the app work. And then we have each of our functional module, which are kind of extendable and can be used by other services as well. Uh, okay, so let's dig into the SDK layer. So the SDK is made up of three main modules. First is comments. So comments forms basically the backbone of the app that we need to use. So it groups together network, authentication, shopper, which is all the classes related to you know the user, like things like points and user account and those things like that. Data layer, which helps us store data locally uh, for uh, preservation. And finally, we have core layer also. So this forms like the most important part of the app and uh, the app cannot exist without it. Utils, on the other hand, is just common function grouped together. Like, let's say you have a class that performs some string manipulation or, you know, um, authenticates a phone number or something, then we just put it into utils. So even other modules and uh, other apps can use this code. And finally, we have the kit. So kit gives us things like, for example, SMS authentication. So the whole flow is packaged into, mod into this module. So you can use it uh, wherever you want in the app. So these are some of the responsibility of SDK. So I spoke about the coordinator part briefly. So what is the coordinator? So coordinator, uh, and you might have been familiar with you know, the RTC organizers and managers here. So coordinator is something like that. It doesn't own anything or has any data, but it just manages UI and the business logic. Then what is, why we have separated business logic and UI? Because sometimes you might want to just use the business logic to get some data. For example, the user's credit card information, but you might not want to show the UI for it. But of course you also need UI. For example, if you want to be able to select your credit card. So all those classes are nested in the UI layer. Okay, next up we get into kit. So uh, again, we have the coordinator on top. You'll be seeing a lot of this coordinator as it's one of the main classes and it provides the interface with the outside world. So in the coordinator, once you define like all the interactions, then you can just work it, uh, work from there. And also one of the interesting things about coordinator is that it makes the app very extendable. Like let's say you want to deploy, uh, you want to re-engineer this whole payment layer, but you're not really sure if it will work. Then you can have two such modules in the app at the same time, so long as the coordinator has the same interface. With that, you can dynamically switch the modules uh, during the, after the application is released, like you know, by a simple server-side flag. 
Then of course, uh, the business logic is grouped separately. The services is the main uh, coordinator in this example that describes uh, all the business logic and what you can do with it. And finally, you have UI. So view controller is what iOS, uh, the main UI class for iOS, and it manages the views and screens and things like that. And finally, we have external module. So this one, we wanted to make it as free as possible. So the only thing we insist on is the coordinator. And through inheritance, we make sure that the coordinator looks like something we expected to. But other than that, uh, you're free to put whatever you are new. And why we have done this is because we wanted other services to be able to make uh, their own modules, which we can plug into our app later. So this helps them achieve that. Okay, next up we change gears and we move on to the protocol layer. So this is briefly our vision for the whole service, uh, Rakuten Pay app. So it's formed of the payment sources, which is credit card, bank, Rakuten cash and points. Our aim is to expand the sources so we can accept and support more and more payments. Then, of course, in the middle we have the app, which is very closely tied to Rakuten ID and forms a bridge between payment and protocols. And finally, we have protocols, which are, you know, like NFC, barcode, Bluetooth, QR code, and those things. Uh, we want to expand this, and this year there was a very exciting announcement in WWDC. So, for those who are not familiar with iOS, like so far, you cannot use uh, iPhone to make NFC, like you can only read NFC tags, you cannot write to NFC, which was making payments hard. But now that the Apple has opened this uh, layer, it uh, helps us expand to new avenues. Okay, now uh, this is something interesting to share. So we briefly did a proof of concept for facial payment. So I often forget to carry my phones or I find it very inconvenient to carry my phone. So what if there was an easy way to make a payment? Because the idea is that in the phone also, the only thing I'm doing is I'm authenticating myself and the phone is doing the payment, right? So if the main objective is to authenticate the user, why not go a step further and make it depend on your face? So how we do this is uh, simple. So we install this terminal at uh, our office. So it's like a huge screen, okay? So it also makes it easy to select, you know, your favorite drink or your food. You can just select your drink and maybe you can uh, add some toppings and something. Then finally you pay with a selfie, a selfie. Uh, please smile. And uh, then uh, once your payment is done, you just walk over and pick up your drink. And that's it. Uh, one more uh, initiative we had, which we did with our uh, partner Lawson at uh, the CTEC conference this year, was the automated check-in uh, payment. So here you can just, oh, sorry. So here you just select the items you want, and then you open the Rakuten Pay app, and you just hold it over the QR code. So it automatically scans your QR and reserves it. Now, once you walk over the automated checkout gate, it uses uh, NFC tags in uh, all your purchases and calculates the bill. And since it already has the QR from the previous step, it completes the payment. So this is much faster than waiting for your turn in a queue uh, at the company. So this was something we uh, demonstrated successfully at the CTEC conference. Next up, Again, uh, we had some more fun with Lawson on this. So you can, uh, uh, Lawson has an app with which you can just scan your products and so that it adds it uh, to the cart. And now you can complete this in one simple step with Rakuten Payment or Rakuten Pay. So if you have Rakuten Pay installed and set up on your phone, you will just jump over to the Rakuten app, complete your payment, and that's it. You can walk out of the company with all your food. Also, one more layer we are expanding is the Eddie SDK. So uh, right now, uh, you, you can, uh, like we have a, uh, diff, uh, another app for Eddie where you can charge your Eddie or you can directly pay if your phone is a OSI for Ketai phone. But uh, we plan to integrate Eddie SDK with the Rakuten Pay app. So it's the one-stop app for making all payments. 
Finally, uh, we have a big partner this year. Uh, it's a penguin and her name is Suika. So, uh, in next year we will be partnering with uh, JR Suika uh, to allow charging and uh, uh, like uh, charging to your Suika with Rakuten payment. And also, but this is not where we are stopping. We are, uh, as I described to you with modularization, we plan to make our application modular and even pieces of it modular. So, if there is any other third party app who wants to use uh, Rakuten payment to just complete the payment part, then they can just take the payment module from our app and kind of uh, join, uh, complete the jigsaw and make a payment. Okay, next up is Joseph to talk about backend API. Hi, <laughs> sorry, 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 there should have been my here. Uh, okay, thank you, Adi. So, let me start by briefly introducing myself. So I come from uh, Slovakia, or officially Slovak Republic, which is a small, lovely country in the geographical center of the Europe. Uh, so after graduating uh, university, which is conveniently located at my hometown, which is also capital city, I joined my previous employer. I was with them for seven years and had the chance to participate on many projects. Uh, most of them were about uh, development of integration solutions, but I also participated on projects that was developing uh, point of sale uh, solution and documents archiving solutions and others. Uh, so more than two years ago, I came to Japan and since then I'm helping Rakt and Pay to stay fast and reliable. Uh, while expanding big and I'm a backend solution architect and technology professional which is just a fancy title I've given myself for the purposes of this presentation. So let's get to the main topics of my parts of the presentation. Speed, security and reliability. So you know that Rakt and Pay is an online payment service. Uh, online in the sense of uh, real time. So our users are using our service interactively, which means uh, they do actions and our service is responding to the actions uh, in real time. So in Rakt and Pay, we are obviously trying to give the user the feedbacks to their actions as fast as possible. But we are also a fintech service, which means we handle money, users' money. And this requires very strong focus on security. Not only security, also reliability. So where do these three attributes come into play? Actually, they are integral parts of our goals, of goals of Rakt and Pay Backend. So we see Rakt and Pay Backend specifically as an interface between payment resources and payment methods. You already have seen a similar picture on one of the slides of my colleague Adi. And goals of the Rakt and Pay Backend is, first of all, not only support more than more payment resources, but support them and access them reliably, uh, sorry, securely, access the, the funds securely. And another goal is to provide all the necessary functionality, but not only so that it works, but also that it is reliable, that it can be used anytime. And lastly, uh, Rakt and Pay backend supports many payment methods, but it should make it possible to do the payments as fast as possible. So why do we actually have these three goals. I believe all of us understand that Japan needs to move to cashless. This means the number of users that are using cashless payment solutions will increase even more in the future. 
and providers of these solutions for payment for cashless payment payments uh, need to make sure or need to make sure that uh, the users of the payments per cashless payment solutions uh, want to use the services and have trust in them because in here we are competing with cash cash that people use for ages cash that people know very good very well and cash that always works so our task here is make people understand that cashless payments are also reliable. We need to make them understand that they want to do cashless payments because they are faster and more convenient, not only for merchants, but especially for them, for shoppers. So our task is make people to like cashless payments. And luckily we are not alone in this endeavor. So Japanese government is also helping us. Uh, I, I, I assume you are aware uh, of October 1st, so since then we not only have a different uh, consumption tax for some uh, products, but we also have a campaign that is strongly supported by Japanese government, uh, where people that decide to use cashless payment methods to pay for their purchases can get rewarded. And so I would like to briefly touch upon how we in Rakuten and Pay back and specifically we're preparing for October 1st for this milestone, it was a huge milestone for us. So uh, we proactively did uh, performance tests and load tests to understand our current uh, performance statistics or metrics and uh, use this information to scale proactively to sustain the expected high load and then subsequently we were very actively monitoring uh, uses, uses, usage of our, our service and did all the necessary actions to keep it functional. Okay, let's talk about speed now. So what do we do to make our processes fast? First and, for, first and foremost, the most crucial thing is using our resources effectively in terms of database it means having optimized database queries. So whenever we are implementing new feature or changing existing feature, we have we we closely look at performance of our queries so that they are fast in terms of CPUs as the resources. Uh, the golden rule is do as much as possible in parallel or as or asynchronously, so that we are using CPU resources effectively. Another thing that uh, helps is failing fast. It means doing only things ne really necessary and nothing more because it, it's about uh, selecting or, or right order of the steps within the processes so that steps that are more, more most often failing are executed as soon as possible so that feedback for the user is fast and our servers are not spending time executing steps that are not necessary. So this puts less load on our servers. So these are two examples how to implement for speed. Then the question is how we run it. And the solution here is scaling. So for us, the priority has to be single transaction speed because we don't want our users to experience slowdowns of their payments or other transactions. Uh, when there is a high load hitting our servers. So the solution for this problem is having resources available for load balancing so that all the transactions are always fast. Little bit about uh, effective use of CPU resources. So you can imagine the payment process as a sequence of steps uh, basically separated in three main phases. So we have payment preparation and validation phase, then we have payment settlement phase, and then some post-payment post -payment settlement uh, actions. So for the preparation and validation phase, what we can and should do and are doing is 
all the things that we can run in parallel, we do run it in parallel. This makes effective use of the CPU resources. Uh, so it makes the preparation validation step faster. Uh, for the post-payment post settlement phase, we do a similar thing. So after the payment, we need to obviously execute some more steps or, or processes. But what we do is execute them in a, like background threads, maybe even on different machines, more on that later, so that the, our, our main thread uh, that is executing the payment process itself can finish as soon as possible and provide a result uh, as fast as possible. So, but the, the implementation for speed is not where it should end. What we are doing is very actively monitoring the use and performance of our modules. For that, we are using uh, APM, which is Application Performance Monitoring or Management Solution uh, called New Relic, which helps us to understand the metrics of our, our processes in a very detailed way and also uh, helps us identify some parts that maybe we need to spend more time optimizing even more and in sit unfortunate situation if there are some troubles for example some external service that we have to use is experiencing some slowdowns we can very quickly identify where the problem actually is okay let's get to the security part so Rakuten pay backend supports many measures related to security. So some of them come into play sometimes before the actual payment processes, some of them at the moment of payments, and some of them after the payment settlement. So when it comes to processes that happen before the payment, we support SMS authentication during new member registration or new device registration. Uh, and CVV2 checks or 3D secure checks for credit cards or memory information checks. At the moment of payment of sales, we are executing or checking something we call payment rules, more on that later, and also in some situation, 3D secure check can be triggered again. On top of that, we are using a risk rating system, which is a Rakuten solution it's a fraud prevention system that is using AI and machine learning. And then after payments, we are updating our payments profile to help us do proper security decisions later for future payments. Okay, a little bit about SMS authentication. As I mentioned, Rakuten Pay Backend supports doing SMS authentication during new member registration and new device registration, which means at the moment when new user wants to start using our service, sorry, or where ex when existing user wants to use a service from the new device. Uh, but then SMS authentication can be also triggered sometimes later during other processes based on various criteria. And in a situation when we see that user fails to pass the SMS authentication, we consider this to be a suspicious situation, and we are temporarily, temporarily locking these suspicious users for preventing eventually potential malicious actions. So we have this same temporary locking functionality implemented when it comes to CVV2 check also. I am sure most of you know that CVV2 is the three digits kind of secret code on the back of your credit card. So in Rakuten Pay Backend, we support CVV2 check when the user wants to add its credit card as a new type of uh, payment method or as active payment method. 
And again, if the user fails to pass the CVV check, we consider this to be suspicious and apply temporary locking. Freely secure check. So, freely secure, as you know, probably is the authentication mechanism by credit card companies, uh, which makes it possible for credit card holders to in advance set some password there that is then required every time the card holder wants to do payment with the credit card online. So, uh, for example, if you're a credit a Rakuten card holder, you can easily set the 3D secure password on the Inavi pages. And uh, within Rakuten Pay service, we do the 3D secure check during member new member registration when the user needs to select credit card for payment. And again, it can be triggered on various criteria during the payment processes themselves. Lastly, uh, payment rules. So, payment rule is something that we are applying or checking for every single payment to decide if we should proceed with doing the payment. And we have different payment rules for different types of merchants because there are like convenience stores and restaurants and drug stores. So these are different kinds of merchants. And at the moment of payment, after we identify proper set of rules based on the type of the merchant, then we check all of those to see if we should proceed with the payment. And the rules themselves that we check are of different types. We have rules that take into consideration the payment attributes themselves, like for example amount. We have payment rules that take into consideration also previous payment history within maybe some time period. Uh, we may have rules that uh, take into consideration maybe the location of the shopper, etc. So, last topic, reliability. What we do to make Rakuten Pay backend reliable? When I say reliability, I mean making sure that all the features and functionalities provided by Rakuten Pay backend are always functioning and usable. So, RPA backend supports many features of the mobile apps by providing APIs. And we have different kind of APIs. And what is wise thing to do and what we are doing is that we are kind of isolating functionalities or APIs supporting functionalities to different clusters of machines. So it's probably no surprise when I tell that we have many machines that are running our backend modules so that we can load balance effectively. And what we are doing is se separating these machines is into different clusters where each cluster is meant to run and provide APIs for specific functions. So the functions are kind of isolated on the clusters. So on the slide you can see like high level breakdown of, of our clusters. So we have a barcode cluster that is contributing to the barcode payments. We have shopper cluster that is handling uh, most of the APIs for the shopper app functionalities. We have merchant cluster that is doing the same for merchant app. And we have payment clusters where actually all the actual payments are being executed. Uh, let me touch upon quickly on barcode payments because on this we I can uh, demonstrate some reliability uh, decisions that we made. Uh, so just quickly introducing how barcode payment works. So POS machine scans the barcode that is displayed on the shop app and the third party gateway uh, bundles or like takes the information about the amount and about the barcode, sends it to our barcode cluster that saves this information and asks payment cluster to do the payment. Payment cluster itself is using Rakuten payment gateway that is common platform to you to do actual payments in for many Rakuten services. So and how is it implemented, the, the barcode payment uh, process itself? We went for asynchronous approach where 
post machine ask our service to do the barcode payment and instead of our service doing the payment synchronously and only after it's done sending back the re response we just start the payment process and tell the, the post machine right away that okay payment is being executed and so, will be finished sometimes later and then at the same time while the payment process is being executed in the background possibly on different machines uh, post machine is asking our service again periodically whether the payment process is finished already and once the payment process actually finishes uh, next time that post machine asks for the status we give them the uh, successful status and the process is finished also on the merchant side so this makes it possible for us to have very fast response times uh, which lowers possibility of some network issues puts less load on our API cluster and gives us opportunity to run the payments processes themselves on the different machines and to run processes on different machines we are using messaging solution where we have API machines acting as the producers, payment cluster acting as the consumers, and in between we are using messages uh, sent through the queues. For message broker solution, we decided to go for RabbitMQ and we are quite happy with it. Okay, so let me quickly summarize. So, Japan needs to move to cashless. And for cashless to succeed, user must find it fast, secure, and reliable. And nowadays, number of users that are using cashless payment solutions will just continue to increase. And in Rakuten Payment, Rakuten Pay Backend specifically, we are always improving our service to provide service that is fast, secure, and reliable. Thank you very much.